Mac. Great, thank you. I'm so thrilled that you guys could join us at the most amazing, gorgeous, strand, rare books room. I have spent more in this room than I have on shoes and clothes and drugs and alcohol and parties combined. So you know it's very dangerous. So um, I'd like to thank the Strand Bookstore for hosting us. And I'm just so excited to be here. And you guys really, um, last night we were at St. Mark's Bookstore. Tonight we're at the Strand. These are the two best independent bookstores in the world, please support bookstores. Please buy everything you can here, even magazines, newspapers. They have really cool tchotchkes downstairs, amazing little notebooks and umbrellas. So let's support our bookstores. And you're, none of my students are allowed to buy books on Amazon. Think of it this way. You can only buy books at places where you could do a reading. OK, that's our rule. Anyway, <laughs> yay. Anyway, so I'm, I'm so excited. The occasion is I just published a novel, What's Never Said, and it took seven years. And what I find is that if I do a reading alone, like a normal person, four people will come. But if I call it Secrets of Publishing Panel and invite brilliant editors and agents and write how you could get published too, it rocks with this kind of a crowd. So anyway, I decided to invite, to, to celebrate, to invite some of my favorite luminaries in the publishing world to help you. And so what I'm going to do is I'll introduce everybody, and I'm going to ask them some basic questions and then we're going to open it up so any questions that you have you absolutely can ask and then we'll sign books after so next to me I'm thrilled to introduce Frank Flaherty and when I met Frank he was the New York Times city section editor who came to speak to my classes I was freelancing for them and he let so many of my students break in and their first clips often were for this beautiful essay section that they did in the city section and he also worked in the home section of the Times and he's since left the Times but he wrote his own book book called The Elements of Story, um, which help will, is, a, is a great help to anybody who's trying to write any kind of um, nonfiction. And, and interestingly, he wound up being able to help me with my novel. What's Never Said also. So he's great with fiction. He now teaches at NYU, and he also does um, ghost editing on the side, which we're going to talk about if anybody wants to hear more about it. And next to him is Kimberly Perel, and Kim works at Wendy Sherman Associates. And the way that I first heard about Wendy Sherman Associates is that they took books by two of my students. Um, one was um, Diana Kirshner, who had a shrink, who had a great book called Love in 90 Days. And the other one was um, Claire Bidwell-Smith, who did a great memoir, The Rules of Inheritance, that Jennifer Lawrence just bought. And then um, Kim met one of my students uh, recently, um, uh, Kara Whitley Richardson, who had a book called Gorge, which just came out in, uh, let's see, it was in, um, uh, Seal Press, and I saw a rave in the New York Times, and she's been on TV. And in between, Kim did her own book. If you don't mind, hold up. She did this great anthology, Wedding Cake for Breakfast, that I was in. So, um, so you know why she's one of my favorite people in the world. And right next to her is Kirby Kim, who's also a fantastic literary agent who does fiction, nonfiction, and also specializes in YA. And at one point, Kirby came to one of my seminars, and my physical therapist, Kenan, was pitching a story about how he survived the Bosnian War when he was 12. And Kirby, who was at the time at WME, um, loved the book, just helped him amazingly with it, got it to the um, best like president, vice president of uh, Viking Penguin nonfiction, and uh, and it was a huge success. So um, Kirby earned a uh, a uh, uh, he's on my list of, of favorite editors and agents, and I um, bug him all the time to do these events. And next to him um, is another fantastic literary agent um, who is does um, fiction, nonfiction, and um, uh, I think, uh, Renee Zuckerbrot, I think that you're also famous for at one of my panels, I think you're the only editor agent in the history of the world who said, I love short stories. I just got six figures for a short story collection. <laughs> so since then, there have been 20 million students of Sue's. Word has gotten out through the grapevine that you're the one agent that will actually consider a short story collection, but we're, we, uh, 
But we're, we're very excited that we have um, literary, uh, literary people out there. Um, next to Renee is Danny L. Perez. And Danny L. Perez is one of the people that I dedicated my book to. And she, um, when I met her, she was an editor at uh, uh, Delacorte, which is a, an imprint of Random House. And she discovered me. She bought my first uh, memoir, Five Men Who Broke My Heart. And we did three books together. And now she'll never get rid of me for the rest of her life. And, um, and she has since moved on to be executive editor at uh, Penguin slash Berkeley. And she has bought several books of people that she's met for me, two novels, and a gorgeous memoir um, by Beth Bernstein called A Charm Life, which was, uh, Beth wrote this uh, great book that started in my class about how she told every of every love and loss in her life through one piece of jewelry. And we actually did all kinds of cool events together. So um, that's Danielle. And next to Danielle is, um, Bina Kumlami, who I met uh, through some friends at Penguin, and uh, also um, has worked on fiction, nonfiction, did a beautiful anthology by my colleague Rob Spillman, and that was a West African writing, right? West African writing and yeah. African writing. Um, and Rob Spillman is the um, the head of Tin House, which is one of the best literary magazines in the country, who's taken a lot of work from my students. So we all did events together, and actually, I found out later that Bina is most famous for being one of the things she's most famous for, aside from writing um, fiction herself and award-winning, she was Saul Bellow's editor. So every time, every chance I get, I get her in a corner because I'm, I'm like, uh, adore Saul Bellow's work. And um, there's one other person coming, which is um, my editor, um, Naomi Rosenblatt, um, who's the head of Heliotrope Books, who actually, I sent her home to get more books because I'm thrilled to say we sold out already and she lives in the village. So I was like, I was like, okay, you can run out and come back. So when she comes back, I'll give her a proper, um, I'll give her a proper introduction. But anyway, we have so many brilliant people here. So let's get rolling. And I want to ask, I want to start questions. And basically, I know that I have a lot of students here that are already getting published and a few with books out. But if you don't mind, we'll go through some of the basics, um, just in terms of getting published in our projects. And then if anybody has questions, raise your hand and we'll, um, we'll get in. And by the way, is there any empty seats next to you? Raise your hand if there's any empty seats next to you. Yeah, come sit down. Yeah, come sit down, you guys. There's a few. Yeah, there's a few. You see, there's uh, some empty seats in the in the second row. Yeah, come sit down, so you get comfortable because we're gonna. Yeah, we're an hour, so um, yeah. There's another one over there if anybody needs a uh, a seat. Okay, so Frank Flaherty. Um, one of the things that I always say to my students, especially if they have um, and clients, um, people in all different fields, if you have a book idea, it's sort of always hard to just like, okay, I'll go sit and write a book. Like, how do you do that? So what I always say to people is, three pages can change your life. And quite a few of my colleagues and students, including including um, Kenan for the Bosnia List, and I see Aspen Matus is here, and she has a huge memoir coming out um, in a couple weeks called um, Girl in the Woods from HarperCollins. And both of them started with three pages. They started with one essay that ran in the New York Times, and from there, what's amazing, if you can publish a really short piece in a good place, editors and agents sometimes then will contact you. So Frank, could you talk a little bit about this? And Frank not only used to edit these pieces at the Times, um, but also, now, if my students, after the class is over, say to me, hey, I have four more pieces. You want to edit them tomorrow? And I'm like, uh, well, I'm kind of on deadline. Why don't you hire this great ghost editor, Frank Flaherty, who used to work at the New York Times, and he can fix them for you. Anyway, so can you talk about, um, it sort of used to astound me how there were, there were students who had never been published before, and they would just, they would write the whole essay, and they would send it to you, and you would just buy it. So, so that actually happens a lot at the New York Times. It does happen a lot, and it happened a lot. It happens a lot more now, I think, because with the web, there's a lot more f venues at the Times and elsewhere uh, where you can publish stuff, often on fairly niche kinds of subjects. You know, if you look at the well, the health uh, area of the Times, you know, you have the couch and you have the menagerie, and you have many different um, slices of topics that, and certainly, you could find, you know, one that fits you. And do you think that it benefits students to? instead of pitching a piece, to write an entire essay first? Because if they don't have clips, then is that your way of sa saying, well, the whole thing works, so I might be able to just take this? Yeah, we need to see the whole piece, because with features like essays, you need to see the thing to see how it was said. How you say it is more than half the, you know, the issue. The angle, of course, is important, but how you say it uh, is really critical uh, for the essay form. 
Great, and um, Kim talking about essays, you did that great essay anthology, Wedding Cake for Breakfast. And um, I'm curious, have you ever, as a, as a literary agent, have you ever seen somebody's work in a newspaper or magazine and then contacted them? And can you tell us a little bit about why does that happen so often? That seems to happen every day. Uh, yeah, of course. I definitely think that um, agents are reading everything, looking for great writers, great material. Whether it's um, I used to I used to really uh, cruise the women's magazines a lot for um, all those personal essays. And actually, Kara was big on the. Is this? I don't know what's happening here. Um, Cara had a bunch of essays in a lot of the women's magazines. Self magazine. She had Self one I love that she did in my class, which was her humiliation essay, which is right mm -hmm. about your most humiliating secret, was I cheated on my husband with food for Self magazine. Yeah, because Cara's book was about hiking Mount Kilimanjaro at is there an echo? At uh, 300 pounds. <laughs> so um, it was a really, a really, really personal story. So I, I knew that she could tell really personal stories and I knew that she um, was really open about her life and that's kind of what you have to be in memoir like that. So personal essay is kind of parlaying into memoir works really, really well. So that's well. happened to you before where you see somebody and you contact them. Oh, absolutely. I remember um, Wendy Sherman said that my student, um, Diana Kirshner, was on the radio. And she heard her on the radio saying, I could teach, she's a shrink, she, I could teach somebody how to find love in 90 days. And that became a book that way. Yeah, because I think, you know, agents are thinking about where's the book in that every minute. You know, you're always kind of like, there could be a book here, there could be a book here. So if you're, you know, you're reading an essay, you're listening to the radio, you're, um, you're reading the newspaper, it's always about where's the book and could that happen. So Great, but Kirby, to talk about the downside, I remember Kennan did three um, essays in a row for the, um, I think it was the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Salon on the Bosnia list. And I, English wasn't his first language, so I wound up helping him with it. But I remember when he sent it to you, Kirby, you said, this is great, but you can't just, a book isn't just a bunch of essays put together. You really have to slow down and flesh that out. So um, Kirby, do you see that? Number one, is that a problem? And also, if you don't mind, could you talk about what, if somebody's going to contact you with a nonfiction project, what you're looking for in a nonfiction proposal? Because it's great if somebody has clips, but that's usually not enough to sell the whole thing. Um, there were two questions in there. I know that. Um, the first question had to do with the disparate kind of essays and with Kennan having three of them. Yeah, I think the, you know, there's um, there's like kind of, sometimes I get material that feels kind of like a loose, like, like little vignettes, I guess. Um, I'm looking at something now where this guy who was part of like a very cool scene in New York definitely has a book in him. I think that's it. I don't know what it is, but um, um, you know, he's like writing these profiles of the interesting people in that scene, and they're kind of interesting, but there's no kind of connective tissue, right? There's no, there's no book, you know. It's like a bunch of blog entries. Um, so with Kennan, there was definitely that feeling of needing to find a through line like you know what is the beginning what is the end what's your arc um you know anybody will tell you that um you know the more you give a readership an excuse to put a book down the less likely they are to pick it back up right so um that was kind of the the challenge with ken and i think you know when it comes to uh non what i'm looking for i mean i have to say that i i, I find very little nonfiction through the slush. I would say that the, um, uh, and when I say slush, I just mean unsolicited kind of popping up in my inbox. Um, most of it is the way that we described before, which is through pieces that are placed um, in magazines or what have you, something that gets some good pickup. Um, I like to look at a lot of filter sites. So um, what is one of those? like? Um, uh, what's that? Nuzzle? I don't go to Nuzzle. 
But I like meta filter. I would go to meta filter, meta filter yeah. or like there was there was one with like science and whatever. Oh, like long reads long or like long form. Atlas. You know, every week. Yeah, out of this, they'll send me like an email with five uh, different um, you know feature length pieces, and that's where a lot of times I'll find an, a writer I've never heard of um, or a story that might be a book, um, and so. I, I think Sue's, that's why Sue's class is so invaluable, is that that is, to be honest, probably the best way to start trying to seed yourself for a book deal, personally. Great, and um, so Renee, maybe you could, you do fiction and nonfiction. So the cliche is that if you want to do a novel or a YA book or short stories, you pretty much have to write the whole thing. But if you want to do, in, unless you've had like four sections in the New Yorker or something like that, or you're famous, you know, um, James Franco gets to write whatever he wants and gets. He's in an anthology, Mike. Yeah, he's in an. Okay, so he gets to write one page and get a book deal. But most of us have to write the whole. Most of us have to write the whole thing. For nonfiction, um, you can sell on proposal and. Renee, can correct me if I'm um, if I'm wrong, but for us, the proposal was the title, the subtitle, an overview of what the book is about, um, sample pages, which um, could be the first three chapters, sometimes as many as 150 or 100 pages, then a marketing analysis, what books are similar to this, and a chapter breakdown, which shows the arc. So Renee, if somebody wants to send you um, a nonfiction book, is that appropriate for the proposal? Uh, Does that sound right? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. You don't need 100 pages. How um, many sample pages so, does somebody usually need? Uh, well, it could be anything from one like fantastic chapter, or I have a really good friend of mine who years and years ago wrote, this is when he wrote his first book, it was called Free Agent Nation. Some people here may have read it by Daniel Pink. Um, I was an editor at the time, I was an agent. and. Um, he had a cover story in uh, Fast Times. Is that the name of the magazine? You guys know Fast Times? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fast, Faster Times? Faster, Fast Company? Fast Company, sorry. Fast Company. Fast Times is a, that's like the beginning of a movie. Right? Fast Times at Fast Richmond Times High. At Richmond High. Aye, that's where my head is. <laughs> so anyway, um, he had the cover story um, at that magazine that Kirby just mentioned. <laughs> and um, so that's what he used um, along with his proposal was this amazing cover story. He also had a great platform, which is a word you'll hear us bandy about. I mean, he had been Al Gore's chief speechwriter. So that was also sort of part of the whole package and in that he was sort of well known. But um, he didn't write a new sample chapter. So let's just say you were lucky enough to have a lengthy article um, in a magazine and it's on the same subject as your proposal you can use that as a sample chapter. Um, I do know a few agents who don't send out any sample chapters. I know that some people might see that as heresy, but um, I think it sort of all depends on a, a number of factors. But what Sue suggested, having a really strong proposal, which you can sort of see as sort of like a road map, so you know how to write your book, and so the editor who acquires your book knows what to expect is really great. And if you could have at least one fantastic um, sample chapter, uh, I think you're in good shape. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. And um, Danielle, you can answer a question that a lot of my students ask me, which is, I still think memoirs are hot. I love memoirs. In fact, um, Beth sold hers to Danielle, and Aspen's is coming out from HarperCollins, and Kennan's did great. So even though sometimes you hear grumbling negative negativity about first-person writing, I mean, my, my family's probably starting it because they hate everything I write. But, but so Danielle got me started with um, my first two memoirs, Five Men Who Broke My Heart lighting up. Now usually with me I just write the whole book and there's a lot of reasons why I do that. One is that I never know what the real book is until I write the whole thing and do the work of it. And I'm always afraid if I write a proposal that it's going to turn into something else. Um, also, I, I actually find it really hard to write what I'm going to be writing about. It's just easier for me to write the whole thing. But Danielle, I do know that some people, and I think um, I think Beth and, and actually Aspen are two of them, do get, propo uh, get book deals on proposals. So you've been an editor at Random House and, and you're a big executive editor at Penguin. When it comes to memoirs, do you prefer to see a whole book or do you prefer to see a proposal? Um, for memoir, I actually prefer to see a proposal um, with chapters. I'd rather not see the whole book if it's a memoir. Um, that goes for mostly for nonfiction in general, and I do fiction and nonfiction for the for the nonfiction. Just as Renee was saying and Sue was saying, you know, that really full 
proposal um, that you would submit to your agent, your agent would work with you on before it goes to uh, potential acquiring editors, and sample material. I mean, the sample material is going to be really important, and an author's platform is going to be really important, as is what the competition is, and comp titles, etc. Um, but yeah, I actually prefer, particularly if it's a memoir, because it's such a personal story, to see sample material and the proposal and the overview and the arc of, of exactly where it's going, where the person is beginning and where they're ending, what, what we're going to be taking away from their proposal, um, from their whole memoir, because I really do like to work closely with a memoirist on their, on their material. So, and in general, I think most, a lot of nonfiction is bought on proposal, uh, whereas a lot of fiction tends to be bought on full manuscript. Am I correct that if somebody wants to sell a novel that you pretty much have to see the whole book before you buy it unless they're well known? Generally unless they have um, some kind of track record or I'm familiar with their previous books. I mean I definitely have bought novels based on partial because um, I knew the author's previous work or you know say they're they're a big author so you you kind of know what they're going to deliver but if it's if it's a first time author you certainly want to see the whole novel because you really want to make sure that they can deliver at the end and it's not going to kind of meander in the middle and then perhaps be disappointing at the end. You want to make sure that there's enough there that you could work with. So, Can I add something to that? Sure. Um, so occasionally you will sell a, a novel in progress or a partial novel with a short story collection. That's a way to make a short story collection more appealing to book editors is if you promise them a novel because that's really what they want to publish anyway. So um, that's sort of the only time when I know as an agent I will really sort of look at a partial novel. I mean, unless it's a client or as Danielle said, someone with a track record, but if you have no track record and you've written this amazing collection, um, if you go to uh, Publishers Marketplace or anything, you'll see a lot of the two book deals are for a collection and a novel or a novel in progress. And, uh, Bina, you work at Penguin and you work with Saul Bellow and I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about um, maybe the difficulties of fiction and a lot of people I know, um, you know, they'll, they'll come to my class and they'll say, uh, you know, I just finished a novel, I'm so excited, what's your agent's name and like, how long were you working on it? Two months. And it's, you know, and so this one took seven years and my first one from when I started until when I got it published was 13 years and in fact, um, it, it, because it took that long, instead of a book launch, we gave it a book mitzvah. But but I find nonfiction can be faster because I find nonfiction is sometimes, if you got, the, actually the line is, if you got the story, tell it, if you ain't got it, write it. But so if you got a good story, like Kenan was a war survivor, so he remembered the story and that was easy to recount. But fiction takes a long time and, and Beanie, as a writer yourself and also having worked with Bellow and some of the greats, could you talk a little bit about um, the process or maybe how how one can um, you know um, slow down and improve your book before you get it to uh, editors and agents too early? Well, I mean, obviously, it goes without saying that you should only hand in your very best effort. And it doesn't matter how long it takes, get it there before you hand it in or have anyone see it. It's far easier for an editor to say no than it is to, for, for, for the person to say yes. And so don't risk that. I mean, you know, I, I know there is this incredible impatience and you, you've been so alone for so long with this thing. And, and I, believe me, I know this myself. I have a couple of friends who I trust with my work and I constantly read new things out and I want feedback and all of that. Um, and we're, 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 we're anxious to get the work out there. But as an editor, looking at it from the other side, you don't want something that's half-baked. You really want it to be absolutely ready to go. Now, it will require another edit. That's why I exist. Uh, sometimes it takes several years uh, before a manuscript is ready to go. Uh, but at least what the author's handed in is the very best they can do. And then we take it from there. Um, I recently worked on something that needed 120 pages cut out of it. And fortunately, the author was, was uh, on board with the whole thing, realized that it was far too long. And this is, this is a huge thing, actually, um, knowing how much to cut and when to cut. Um, uh, because I think uh, these days, brevity is what it's all about. Gone are the days of the you know, 900 page novel. Some mm. people do still get away with it, but generally, you know, um, generally novels tend to be on the shorter side. So 
pare it down as much as you can, have it in as good a place as you can get it before you even show it to an agent. That's my recommendation. Um, fantastic. And um, uh, next to uh, Bina is my editor, Naomi Rosenblatt. And um, my favorite moment this week was I was doing a shrinks or away reading, and my shrink, one of my shrinks, but a shrink that I've seen a lot who knows all my problems about career, went up to um, Naomi and I said, This is my editor. And he said, Thank you so much for publishing Sue's novel. We all thank you for publishing uh -huh. Sue's novel. I think he was like bowing down. Anyway, um, and the way that I met Naomi, I always say to my students, I'm not helping you get published because I'm nice. It's because I want to steal your editors. And it used to be a joke, but then she published um, uh, Royal Young, one of my students, his memoir. He had a great memoir called Fame Shark. And then she also published the novel of a colleague of mine, Kate Walter, I'm Looking for a Kiss. And a after I was freaking out at the 8,000th rejection of this novel that I love, What's Never Said, I happened to see that Heliotrope was doing um, fiction, which was so exciting. And, um, and so could you, just with uh, Heliotrope, could you tell us a little little bit. I know you're doing fiction and nonfiction. And if I remember correctly, you said that you actually like, um, it's funny, they always say to me, I don't play in Peoria, like you're too New York. Somebody somebody read it and actually said, they, I love this book. Could you just get rid of all the New York stuff, all the poets, and um, and all the Manhattan stuff, and then I'll love it, you know, which was hilarious because that would leave about three words. But, um, but Naomi actually says she wants Greenwich Village stuff. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, what Heliotrope might be open for now? Well, basically, I, I am here with a I'm one woman, one computer, and I am a publishing house. <laughs> and since I'm located in New York City, I think it's kind of natural. I'm, I'm sort of like a regional press in a way. So I, I like New York centered material. It helps me choose uh, my fiction. And um, with memoir and nonfiction, I'm a little more broad about that because it's just a little, there's more happenstance in it. But I do also publish uh, cross-genre books, books that um, the bigger houses often decline because the category is unclear. For example, cookbook memoirs. Or we're doing a memoir written by a teacher that has uh, exercises for children in it. So we do that kind of thing. We do sort of experimental, edgy books. And uh, that's the kind of submission, well thought out, but um, appropriate. Great, and if people want to understand the difference, usually what happens is if you approach one of the major 10 publishing houses, you almost always have to go through a literary agent, and it takes a long time, and they pay you in advance um, for the work, and it often takes 18 months or two years from the time you give them the book till the time it comes out, and you're really working with a whole team, and there's rules, and, and there's thr it's thrilling, um, but I will say the benefit of a small publisher is, um, Naomi said yes to this, the end of March and the hardcover's out, and um, uh, also usually what happens with a lot of small houses is they do not give you big advances up front, but um, th they can give you as much as 50% royalties. So actually several of my students have made a lot more money um, working, uh, you know, when they promote their books because if you sell a lot of copies, you benefit more. So it's, it's cool that you have a lot of choices, and what I've decided after several therapy sessions is you can do all of them. You can do both. So some projects are, I think, appropriate or great for big houses and I think some projects are sort of more exciting and fun for, for small publishers. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite questions I'm going to ask everybody is, could you tell us what are writers and people that are submitting material, what are they doing wrong? And Frank is the perfect person to talk about one of my tricks that I learned, which was, um, I used to, I always say the worst thing to do is to finish a project at three, you know, whether it's a essay, a uh, pitch, a memoir, a novel, finish it at three in the morning, decide it's brilliant, and start sending it out on your computer. And unfortunately, that's so easy to do that a lot of people do that now. Um, so it seems to me that the smartest thing to do is you want to get a system. And a system means that you write something, and even if you think it's brilliant and you're all excited about it, it tends to be really smart if you have cr critics, whether it's a class or a mentor, um, or a writing workshop, or somebody that could take a look at it and tell you the truth. And if there's people in your life that'll look at it and say, oh, you're so brilliant, 
ask somebody else who will help you more because that sometimes isn't that helpful. And so what I found through some friends is that there's a, there's this whole tribe of people that I didn't even know exist existed called ghost editors or book doctors. And you so you could actually hire a former New York Times author. And I know um, Betsy Murray is here, and she was an editor at Random House for many years working on um, fiction. And Angie Chan is here, and she's at FSG, and she specializes in YA. And there are actually people that you could hire to if you can afford it to pay to kick your material into shape so that you don't humiliate yourself and ruin your connections to literary agents and editors so what happened with me was two friends told me about it and I um, I, I called a ghost editor when I f did my first um, memoir. I wrote the whole thing. And when she said it was going to be about $2,000, I thought it was ridiculous. And I remember having a shrink appointment and saying, this is the dumbest thing I ever heard. The whole reason I'm doing a book is because I need to make money. And my shrink said, don't be an idiot. Um, sometimes you have to spend money to make money. And this, this ghost editor, I had been told by two friends who had gotten really big book deals, one fiction and one nonfiction, um, that she's amazing and I spent two thousand dollars on the ghost editor and and was scared but I did everything she said and then my first advance was fifty thousand and I had uh, a, a film deal a TV deal um, for that book I had seven foreign rights and it's nine books later so not only do I swear on ghost editors, I actually at one point used four ghost editors for one book because I wrote it. One ghost editor helped me. She was good at structure. I rewrote it. Then I had one that was a great line editor. And again, another, my first novel, I actually spent $4,000 on all these ghost editors because now I knew it worked. And then again, I got a $50,000 advance. So every time I've used ghost editors, it's, it's, it works. Now, I wouldn't say just go on the internet and find any ghost editor. I personally only work with ghost editors who have been at newspapers or magazines or publishers because I know that they are, because even if you get smart advice, you want advice that's marketing, market advice. So Frank, could you tell me a little bit, just for an example, I send a lot of people to you who want to write um, articles for the New York Times or essays. So what does it look like when, you know, an average ghost, ghost editor gets like $100 an hour, somebody will give you five or six pages. What's the process look like? I mean, are you line editing? Are you changing the lead? Are you helping them? Um, yeah. yeah, talk about that. Well, for me, um, the biggest flaw or error that people make in their writing is not keeping the ball rolling because that's what readers want. They don't really want your brilliant descriptions of foliage, they, which may be brilliant. But after one paragraph of that, they want to know what happens next. And it was like Stephen King, who sold a number of books, who said something like, you know, um, the main thing readers want, if a book gets boring and a, write, and a reader puts it down, it's because the writer forgot his main job, which is to keep the ball rolling. So that's sort of what you have to keep in mind is things have to happen. Now making them happen and happen well is like another challenge, but the first hurdle is making sure that things happen and that the reader at the end of the book or the essay or the article feels like they're in a different place than they were in when they started reading. So if somebody gives you a piece, you will not only line at it, but you'll say to them, wait a second, you're losing me here, or take, the, you know, this isn't exciting enough, or this isn't, this is going too slow, and you'll give them structural comments. Right. Well, I mean, writing is like reducible to two things, action and commentary, which is everything that's not action. So what you need to do is make sure that the through line of the action, you know, is there and is vibrant and there's not too many, not detours in thinking or topic, but sort of like places where the, where the story is standing still. So show, don't tell. Yeah. And may I ask, add one thing about what we were saying before about essays, which are a great way to sort of get your name and your topic before the literary world. Um, another way to do it, because I was thinking about the essays we published, a second also good way to do it for those who report is through reported pieces. Because I can think of half a dozen books offhand that came from articles we published in the Times, not by necessarily big time staff reporters, but freelance writers who, you know, had an idea and wrote up a 2,000 word, maybe story, maybe less, um, that and they would get calls from agents. Um, one of our writers, a freelancer, um, went to the International High School in Brooklyn and in the spring 
and the kids who were in the senior class were from 28 different countries and in none of the languages of those countries was there a word for prom none of them knew what a prom was and they were seniors and so they formed a committee a research committee to find out what a prom was and then they could have a prom and the writer whose name is Brooke Hauser um, wrote a piece up for us about this um, you know this fascinating thing and um, it ultimately became a book and it became a book because she said this is cool in itself a bunch of kids getting together who were trying to figure out this American weird custom called the prom um, plus they had money issues many of them and there were all those dramas but she said you know this is also like this is like what becoming American is these are kids from like Tibet who were like living in a yurt a few months before. So she sort of saw the cool story and the story beyond it and it became a great book called uh, The New Kids because they were like the newest of new kids. Anyway. That's cool, but no, that's great. And also I would say op-ed pieces which are shockingly short. I've had students do 600, 800 words op-ed pieces and get agents and editors. The most recent one is um, Cassie Underwood did a piece about, she had an abortion and she discovered this new group that wasn't pro-abortion or um, anti-abortion. It was, I think it was called a, um, pro-voice. And she wrote this great um, op-ed piece in the Daily News, and she got editors and agents interested in it from an, a short op-ed piece, and she just sold the book to Simon and Schuster. So, so sometimes even you know two pages can change your life. So I actually find that an exciting way to start. Um, Kim, could you talk to us as a literary agent? I'm sure you get a lot of queries that are off base. So I love asking editors and agents, like, tell us the truth. What are your idiosyncratic um, no-nos? Like, what if somebody? What, what what would somebody do? Um, that would make you just think, I'm, I'm never going to work with this person again. Uh, and by the way, one of them, I think, is like everybody gets a little bit too familiar and friendly, I think. So I've actually had a lot of editors and agents say someone, they'll, they'll pitch them and send them stuff on Facebook and Twitter. And they'll be like, hey, dude, I saw you on Twitter. Here's my book. Okay. And they'll send them the whole thing without um, asking first. So so that would be alienating, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't call us at home. Don't, don't come over. Yeah. Actually, we, a, lo we, a lot actually of people, have people say, We actually have had people come to the office. We're like, we show uh, up. We have a small, people show up, definitely. A lot of people say, if I don't know you, don't call me. Like, they don't even oh. pick up the phone anymore, right? Yeah, I put that on our website, actually. <laughs> so, so tell us. What, I know it sounds no, but no, no, it's no. True. But be, but see, there's a lot of different kinds of businesses, so people don't necessarily understand. So, could you talk about not only what's alienating, but also then what's the appropriate way to handle an agent? Yeah, no, and, and I didn't mean to say you know never you know get in touch with an agent. Um, a lot of agents are very very open to hearing from everyone, um, but. So what would alienate you? What would alienate me would be, um, we go through lots and lots of queries on a daily basis. So, you know, something like starting with, I know you're really busy, but that's not a dynamic way to start. It's apologetic. It reminds us that we are really busy. Something like that it wouldn't be, you know, dynamic. So, um, by the way, start with, you were so brilliant at the Strand panel. I bought your book immediately. That's a good start. <laughs> well, right? if you met someone, of course, definitely start with that. Um, but I, I think a dynamic opening line um, is something attention grabbing is it's, it's really basic but it's extremely important and you should spend a lot a lot of time on your query letter it shouldn't be an afterthought it should be at the forefront of your mind you should spend as much time as you possibly need to make that impression because it's the most important thing it's the difference between whether or not we're going to keep reading and um, very little time is spent on each query so I think that's really really important and um, and also obviously you know there the, the the missteps range from like the very egregious to the like oh I wish you didn't do that kind of thing but uh, it's kind of like don't tell us you know that it's gonna be a bestseller don't keep selling it you know I was even talking to a potential client the other day and he was like this is gonna work because of this it's gonna work because of that and I kind of wanted to you know think about why it was gonna work myself like he didn't need to keep selling it we I just wanted to hear what the book was about yeah, they also say like don't compare your itself. book to great Gatsby exactly yeah don't compare your book to you know to mega bestsellers or classics and you know tell us who's gonna play you in the movie um, 
So, but, but, but I will say, because of classes like Sue's and because of all the information online, the queries have gotten better and better and better, which just made our job harder because we really were like, oh, this, this all sounds really kind of interesting. So, um, I do think that there's a lot of information out there to write a really great query. Good, and um, Kirby, you were at WME and now you're at uh, Janklo Nesbitt, which are pretty big agencies. So, um, what, what kind of mistakes do people make when they're contacting you? Um, uh, at WME, there's a lot of like, um, like synergy queries, like this is, you know, here's the book, but this is going to be a huge movie, you know, and there's probably an album in here somewhere, too. <laughs> you know, there's like, it's like cart before horse stuff, I think. Um, I would, I mean, there, w there probably is an album here. We just got to get there, right? Let's do the book. Um, I think, uh, you know... You know, we all have our laundry list of things that like are automatic deletes. I think. Um, Could you tell us some of yours? A lot of people, a lot of agents are saying you d you're sending me the wrong genre. So if somebody's saying, "Hey Kirby, I got a cookbook," probably you're not going to be the person to handle that, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, probably not. You know, I think um, like I don't do picture books really, like children's picture books, and maybe I've done one. You know, and it's on Publishers Marketplace, but. You know, generally I don't. Um, you know, I mean, uh, typos in the query letter, which alludes to what Kim was saying, you know, it's like an e immediate kind of, that's pretty sloppy. Um, just spend as much as you can, as much time as you can. I think hassling time-wise, like, I, I'll, I'll get like a query letter and then a week later it'll be like, so is there any interest here? And I don't know. I do that to editors, so I apologize. <laughs> but I think it's different. It's different when I. How long should somebody wait? Right. How long right. should somebody wait to follow up with an agent? Three weeks? A month? Longer? I honestly think like a month is a good amount of time. I mean, I generally will get back to somebody if I'm interested pretty much right away. That's my thing. Mm. Um, but if you want to follow up after a month, it's, I, I think that's, that's fine. And honestly, to be honest, like I can't respond to every query, unfortunately. Um, but if somebody I haven't responded to and said I'm interested in it, it gets to me and, uh, and follows up on their own query a month later, I will at that moment respond and say, you know what, I took a look and it's not for me. Because I did, I read every query and I make a decision uh, very much on the spot most of the time. Great. Um, so that's the thing. And then the one thing, the one other thing is in kind of line with that is, um, is like I'll get a query and um, I'll ask for a manuscript or a partial and then like two weeks later they'll email me and be like, I did some work on it, and uh, look at this one, you know, don't look at that one. Which says to me that you didn't take it as far as you could, that you probably have way more work than just two weeks of work to do on it. Um, and I kind of check out after that, I would say. So. Also, if you can see who else they sent it to, that's not good. Make sure we can't see all the other agents you're sending, <laughs> you're sending this to. I'm kind of like, oh, you know, him, her, <laughs> that's cool. Like that, that's not something that you know you want to see. But <laughs> we we read them all, so that's the good news. Um, they're good. not going into outer space. Um, Renee, I know I sent you somebody who um, first sent you a five-page resume. You don't ever have to send your resumes to editors and agents unless they request it. Then he sent you a short story collection, and when you said no, he's like, "How about this project?" So oh, right. that's not not really a good thing to do, and that sort of speaks to what Kirby was saying: is that you can't really. You tell me, Renee, but it seems to me that you should be, you should pick your best project that you think is the most publishable and start slow and write a really nice short query letter about one project. Right, I forgot about the never ending query. So, the, <laughs> so from our perspective, it's really hard to find one awesome project. So when someone comes along and says, look, I have 17, you know, wow, um, it, it's really not appealing. I mean, some people think that the more the better, like the more choices you as an agent have to find what you like. But what it says to me is, you know, you haven't spent the time writing one really fantastic, amazing, publishable book. So Sue's friend, unfortunately, it wasn't a good match. Um, my bugaboos, I will tell you right now, the things that irk me, um, dear agent, because when I send things to Danielle, I do not write dear editor. <laughs> um, so don't write dear agent, don't write hi. Um, 
The other thing that really um, irks me is, so I am very particular in the way I like to receive my queries because I wear glasses. And so I want Word documents. I don't want eight point type in the body of an email. So my queries are really, it's just send a Word document, 12 point double spaced, boom, tell me who you are, tell me about your project, tell me if you have publishing credentials. So I get these queries that say, dear Renee, per your submission guidelines, and then there's nothing that is per my submission guidelines. It's like, here are the first 50 pages in the body of an email. Um, thanks, hope you like it. And I'm thinking, someone else's submission guidelines, not, not mine. So I know it's a pain, but every agent has different submission guidelines. Sorry about that. Um, and, and you know, I assume that when you're sending stuff out, you're not querying 75 agents at once. You're maybe doing 10 or 11. So what you really need to do is go to every agent's website and no matter how irksome it is, and I guarantee you it will be irksome, but see exactly how they like to receive queries and, and send it that way. I mean, I will not read 50 pages in the body of an email. I'm sorry, I just, I can't. Um, my eyes don't work that well anymore. So um, if you're gonna query me, my guidelines are up there, follow them. The other thing is because I get more than 100 queries a week and my assistant and I can't read them, I have an auto response, which says if you don't hear from me in four to six weeks, I will not be requesting to see more with a link to um, agentquery.com. And despite that, I still have people calling and, and doing all kinds of things and you know, um, calling to show up actually. I get a lot of people inviting themselves over as if we have <laughs> tea and cake every day at four and you know, it's like patronage in the White House in the 19th century. We have people in. Um, we, we don't, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, um, we are busy, which is why we don't like to get um, phone calls. Plus, and this is where I'm gonna end on, so it's all about the writing, right? It's not about how you pitch yourself on the phone, correct? It's about what you put on the page. So when you pitch on the phone, I have no idea what's on the page, which is why we don't like to take phone calls or get pitches by phone. But if we can see how you're writing a submission letter, I mean, that's a, a head start for us. That gives us an idea. So we're not grouchy, usually, but the phone thing really is sort of a practical, the reason we don't want phone pitches is because practically it really doesn't make sense. Great, and by the way, if you're new to this, um, I'm giving out my cards um, now that I, I've quit all my addictions, which I've written about, quit cigarettes, alcohol, dope, gum, and bread, so now I'm addicted to email and book events. But so if you have any questions, email me. I've had 85 students that have done book deals in the last 10 years with advances between 5,000 and 500,000, and all of them went through agents, and the agents have been wonderful. So it's not as if, I mean, they're desperately looking for great material, both agents and editors. It's just that there's a, a good way to learn how to do it. There's a hundred little steps. And if you don't know, email me and just ask because it's not hard to figure out. Okay, um, Danielle, who's one of my favorite editors in the universe, Danielle and, and Naomi, I dedicated the book to. Could you tell us what are your pet peeves about manuscripts? Now, usually with Danielle and, and uh, Bina, because they work at big publishing houses, they're getting manuscripts through agents, but there's still, even if an agent takes you on, there's still mistakes. And I know Danielle, Danielle, a lot of, a lot of um, editors have told me that they, they're still getting material that's half-baked, they're getting proposals with only 10 sample pages, or they're getting a novel that really needed another draft. Are you seeing projects that are okay but needed more work? Well, of course, I think that's always a situation, but it's a little bit different for acquiring editors because that's exactly how agents are sending the material to us, so I can't, I can't really speak about how different agents do different things, you know? Um, so that's not really something that the author is, what, what was that now? Tell me how I'm doing. <laughs> These three are great. Perfect, 100% every time. Um, I would say in terms of, it's different for something that I'm trying to acquire or something that I own. It's, you know, it's different things. But for an acquisition, I think for the nonfiction, it is not really doing the research on comp titles, on what else is out there. Um, I think that's so very important that it doesn't, something isn't submitted, that this is the first book on blank and I do a cursory look on Amazon and I'm like, hmm, there's actually been three books in the past few years on blank. Um, I wonder how they've sold, maybe well, maybe not well, but I'm not sure how interested I am now at that point. Um, and also making sure your comp and marketing, uh, your comp titles, are very are pretty accurate that they're not 
this book is just like Eat, Pray, Love. This book is just like X, Y, Z. Um, that you really are very thoughtful in, in the research that you do because it is actually really, really important for nonfiction. And even once we acquire a book, the kinds of work that we do that the acquiring editor does for comp titles and stuff is actually quite a lot. So it really, um, I think it's really important to to know what the comp titles are. And I would just say, just backing up even just for nonfiction and fiction, for people who are writers and want to be writers, I think the biggest thing to do is to read. To just read, read, read other people's work. To not just think, oh, I want to write. If you want to write, you should want to read and be reading constantly other people's work as well. I think that's really, really important too. One thing I was just going to mention on the ghost editing, because, um, and it might be called ghost editing in different parts of publishing, but in, in book publishing, I think there certainly are ghost editors, but we, we tend to call them freelance editors. So just in case if you are looking for people, and there are tons of excellent freelance editors out there, many of whom have worked at the big houses and do kind of bring that marketing mind in addition to a developmental editing, line editing, et cetera. And I can't, I can't underestimate uh, how important they are to something that you're going to send out for, uh, send out to agents, and then the acquiring editor, me, if I acquire something, still don't worry. We'll put you through your paces, and we'll edit, we'll edit the book, and work with you on it. But I think having the book in the best shape as possible. I just wanted to mention that sometimes they're called freelance editors or developmental editors too. Good. And Athena, could you talk about some of the, the manuscripts that you see? Um, what are, the, what are the biggest mistakes that you think writers are making? You already touched on it a little bit, that it's yeah. they're too fast and they're not sending out their best draft and they're not taking the time. Is there anything else you can think of? Well, I, I mean, I think, I think I want to add to, to the g general conversation that's been going around this table, which is um, this is probably the most subjective industry in the world. There isn't another industry like this. Think about it. You know, um, it, it, you have this wonderful idea, there's a concept, and you go through all these many years of hammering out that concept on the page. Um, it's a difficult, difficult uh, journey from concept to delivery. We in publishing exist to facilitate that process. Whatever else book publishing might be about, it eventually comes down to one thing. It's about the book. And it's about taking the book from the reader to the writer. That's why we're there. That's why I'm here. That's why Danielle is here. Uh, the entire industry is about that. But it, I think common sense, therefore, is what I'm advocating. Because you're dealing with such a variety of people, we all have our hot buttons. You can't possibly know what these are, you know? Uh, so I think common sense is, is, is key. Would you like to hear from someone, you yourself, if you put yourself in an editor's shoe, would you like to hear from someone who's bragging about their book before you've even had a chance to read it, or telling you how great it is and what a wonderful movie it's going to become, or, you know, think about it. Put yourself in the person's We're just shoes. humans. Yes, and you just, you know, uh, besides that, besides the fact that we're all individuals, each one of us, there's also the, uh, the, 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 the complexities of living in a city like New York where anything could set you off, you know? You get to the office, anything. Um, you know, the bus driver, the, 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 the subway driver, whatever, anything. Uh, and you get there, and here's this person in your face saying, you know, I'm the best thing you've ever seen. <laughs> you know, it's going to, you, it doesn't matter what the merits of that work are, you're not even going to give it a chance. So I think, I think putting yourself in the receiving, uh, at the receiving end, so that you become the editor or the agent who's getting this, might be very yeah, that's brilliant. And by the way, a lot of newspapers and magazine editors and webzine editors have to have said that exact thing to my class. They're like, don't think, oh, I want to publish this, so I'm going to send it. What would make an editor's life easier? And by the way, just dumb things, like Google them. And so instead of starting with, here's my brilliant piece I want you to publish, you could say, oh, I, you know, I love the piece that you wrote last week. It was brilliant. I love what you do in your column. You know, so, so making it easier, putting yourself in the, in, you know, what would make the editor's life easier, that's brilliant. 
I'm Naomi, and we're going to open it up to questions in a minute. Naomi, could you talk about what people are doing wrong for you? And I remember you said to me that part of the reason why you like my project and Royals and Kate's was that we were all people who were very good at getting out there ourselves. So we weren't just writing a book, but we did newspaper work and magazine work, and we all had um, were on Twitter and we were doing Facebook, and we all sort of were were out there. So you said that you know you want to pick people who can do some promotion themselves. So would you say that that might be a mistake that people are making where they're sending a, a book project and they sort of have the fantasy that um, that the publisher is going to do all the work and that you're more attracted to to authors that are already um, you know have followers and fans and and their name is out there. Yeah, nobody should count on me to do it all because I'm basically one person and I have, you know, consultants that I work with on an as-needed basis. I am a genuinely small press. And I'd, I'd like to answer your question by actually talking about um, a couple of pitches that I've gotten recently that were done really well. Somebody, people who've done things really right. Um, in fact, uh, somebody in this very room. Um, uh, what people do that I really like is they'll they'll um, begin by relating themselves to me and saying like, I'm one of Sue's students, or we met at the Writer's Digest contest that you spoke at last weekend. They put it in a context that I can immediately relate to. And then they get right to the point and tell me what their book's about, why they're passionate about it. Um, and uh, if they've written for uh, magazines or, or newspapers, they send their clippings along, you know, sort of, Wetting my appetite for it. As and, and somebody schlepped all the way from Boston um, asking me in advance, could I meet your editor? So that's, you know, smart. So show up, showing up in person. Yeah, that shows a real commitment. That shows muscle power. At this, they yes, asked. at this event. Oh. This event, they uh, they they're from Boston and they were interested in doing a project, and so they emailed me and said, "What's the appropriate way to meet your editor, Naomi?" And I was said, "Well, we just happen to be doing a bunch of events together, so that could be great." So, aside from just an email, which you're sort of an anonymous one, ten thousand emails, come say hi, and and he happened to have a great clip that he showed her. So, so there's actually a, a really smart way to approach editors and agents that would would give you a, an edge, right? Yes, a, a leg up. Good. I appreciate. That. When people take the time to think that through, and to and to think, as as you were saying about our end of it, you know, put put yourselves in our shoes, and you know, conversely, when I see a letter that's really well written, I'll think to myself, gee, that's the kind of letter I used to write to, to agents and editors myself. Yeah, it's really important. It's very important. In fact, I get millions of emails. I don't even know why, because I don't buy anything. But when the email starts with like, you know, my professor says I'm brilliant, and I have this new novel I've just finished, and you, it's like delete you know like letters we never finish reading but if the just because i'm busy and why i don't know who you are and whatever but if the if the letter starts with frank flaherty gave me your email i'm already like oh shit i have to be nice to this person because they started with the connection or if it says oh congratulations on your new book what's never said i just ordered it i'm like oh what a cool smart person you just it's like psychological but you just if somebody has done their homework even if it's one google it just makes you like them more okay so we'll take questions and by the way number one don't pitch the editors directly you don't say here's my project you can email me and we could talk about what's the best way to get a hold of them and don't do a seven part question which i always get but anyway otherwise questions Yes. I have a question regarding the ghost editors or the freelancers, mm -hmm. which is a cynical question because I'm cynical. Okay. Um, why, if somebody sends something to a ghost editor, like Mr. Clary, for example, and it sucks, like, Okay, good question. When you deal with ghost editors, if you send something to a ghost editor and it sucks, would they be honest? Okay, what's really fantastic about the ghost editors that I work with, and I have a list and you can email me, because again, you're not getting them on the internet, these are people I know well, is yes, they will say in a nice way, this doesn't work. And, and by the way, in my class, someone will say, I want to publish this in the New York Times, and I will say, nobody in the New York Times will take this. You have to rewrite it. Where's your timely lead? What section is it in? You know, so, so yes, if you have, um, uh, I have found with teachers, with um, ghost editors, uh, with my writing group, we are, we are unbelievably horribly honest with each other because nobody, it doesn't do anybody good if you send out your work to a New York Times editor or to, um, to an agent or to Penguin or whatever and you get rejected. Not good for anybody, because just for an example, if you're using, I mentioned three great ghost editors here. We have Frank, that's, that, who's brilliant with nonfiction, and especially nonfiction, and with articles. And Angie Chen is brilliant with YA or children's books. 
and Betsy Murray is great with novels. If you use any of them as a ghost editor and you don't sell your work, you're not going to like them. You're not going to use them again. You're not going to recommend them. If you take my class and I don't help you, you're not my fan. You're not showing up at my at my panel, right? But as I mentioned, there's so, I see so many students here that have gotten published. I mean, it benefits me to help everybody get you know t to help people get what you want and I have found that the ghost the ghost editors that I work with are brutally honest and I beg them to be brutal brutal brutally honest so I think um and, and actually somebody emailed me back after Angie looked at her book and and he just said she said this is not a YA book this this is closer to a memoir she said I'm nowhere in the vicinity and he was pissed off but I thought well thank God she told him because someone could have wasted six months or a year um Frank how often do you say to somebody this is not New York Times or you know this isn't ready to say yeah. um, I understand where the question's coming from. Um, but there's like nothing you can do with something that you think can't be recovered. Sometimes you say no, right? And I, you say, I also say no. And it's not like there's not, there's not more than enough to do, you know? Um, but you really don't know where to go if you say something like that. I mean, I've spent a life... I, I'm an editor, you know, so what I do is say what I think about something. And if I think it's like, you know, there's nothing better than something that's like really an essay that really works. It sort of happens on the other end too. I say this thing is like a markup, which means put it in the paper. Send it to the Times. I can't help you because it's fine. But um, yeah, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but it's just sort of like you just stare at the screen if, you, if something doesn't work. You don't know what to do. Yeah, and by the way, I've, I've actually had a lot of ghost editors that surprises me, but they will say no to a project. Like, they'll say, send it to me first before they charge you any money. They will say, let me take a look at this. And they will say... I this is it. They'll say it nicely. This isn't my kind of thing, or I don't think I could help you with this, you know. And and in the same way, when I do my classes and my seminars, I'll often say to people, I want a writing sample first. And if it's somebody that I, d you know, that I don't think would I could help, I'll be really honest with them. I've so, them two books, I think, in the past few weeks that I couldn't do something. I just they didn't work. I didn't know what to do. Yeah, so I do think, and again, you're not getting these people off the internet. I'm saying you can use my name, Susan Shapiro, because I've worked with them before, and I'm, I know how they operate. And, and actually, I ask them to be really straight with, with writers, because I think the, the kindest thing you could do is say to somebody, do not rush this out and embarrass yourself. Good. Other questions? Yes, this man over there? Yes, uh, one question. You see, much, much of the discussion has been based around those who are within the system, the, your students, people in New York, what about those who are completely outside, who are not connected to any MFA program, who are not connected to any university, who are not connected to New York? Yeah, I mean, I'm from Michigan and I have, I actually work with students and clients not only um, all around the country but internationally. Um, and I think that, um, at least all around the country, there's similar programs. For example, I do, I've done a lot of work in Michigan. I've done stuff in LA. I've done stuff at Philadelphia, a lot of colleges. So I think that almost anyone that's ever emailed me has access to, um, and also now there's a lot of stuff going on online. So the people that I know, um, you know, if they've, I mean, it's great if you spent several years writing a book in your basement in Montana, that's fantastic, but then I still think that um, before you send it out to editors and agents, it's a good thing to um, find somebody who could help you with it. Um, but anybody else want to yeah. respond? I'm going to go back to the query letter. You write an awesome query letter. No one cares where you're from, whether you have an MFA or what your platform is. I mean, I've taken on writers um, I don't know at all. Like, query arrives, and I think, wow, this sounds really interesting. I'll ask for material if there isn't, or I'll read the chapters they send and then ask for more. I'm thinking, like, this is great. I don't really care where you live. I mean, as long as I can reach you and I don't have to fly to the moon. And, you know, I want to represent you. So sort of where you come and all that stuff sort of, is less important. I mean, it's nice when someone writes to me and says, oh, I have an MFA from Iowa. I think, oh, and I publish some stories here. I mean, it's enticing, yes, because I'm thinking, oh, okay, they've already done some of the legwork, right? Makes my job a little easier, and, um, you know, they have these publishing credentials, so they must have some talent. But then there are, there are plenty of stories about people who just, you know, spent however many years writing fiction, nonfiction, took some writing classes, maybe not in an MFA program, but just took uh, continuing education classes, um, and they were really, really smart. And as Danielle pointed out, they were readers. So here's the secret. Here's what you're going to find out. Your favorite writers, people who write, you know, series fiction and nonfiction, 
children, they've been reading since they were in the womb. Okay, so um, I mean they are lifelong readers. I mean that's what you find out, right? So you're a lifelong reader and you decide to start writing and you just, you write something great and I promise you, you will find an agent and a publisher because we're all, there's so little stuff that's truly great. Um, Sue, of course, her stuff is great as is Kim's stuff and, um, and Frank's stuff, but they're really, there's a lot of stuff that's sort of mediocre. We want stuff that's great. So just, I know it's a tall order, but write something great and you know, you'll have multiple offers there's of also representation. A trick with nonfiction, which is there's, if you've done something extraordinary, like for example, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of shrinks and scientists now that are writing really um, and, and doctors who are writing really fascinating books, and in that case, sometimes you work with a ghost writer or a ghost editor because you, you know, your field or what you know in your field is really fascinating, and you could, um, you know, publish books that way. Yes. Can I jump off the book of one gentleman? Sure. Um, I come from a very, very small, very, very rural country. Um, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Thank you. I come from a very, very small, very, very rural country. One what country? Okay, so she comes from very, a very rural place in Ireland. Well, I'll tell you what's great. What's great is that you obviously speak and write English. So there are quite, no, I'm serious, there are quite a few, no, but there's quite, no, but what's fantastic is that there's quite, there are many off the top of my head, I could just start thinking of how many um, authors I love who are from different countries that do extremely well in this country. So I don't necessarily think it's a problem. I think if you write something great, there's no reason why you have to, um, you know, be sending work out to a publisher in Ireland. You could absolutely be sending work to any of these agents in this country. No, but America is a, is very open to um, is very open to look at look at um, Frank McCourt, uh, Jhumpa Lahari. I mean, you know, Salman Rushdie. Uh, uh, Kenan was Bosnian. I mean, you know. So so I actually think that if I have a student that's from another country or speaks two or three different languages, I think they already have a leg up because multicultural p uh, work is so popular now. Quick. Um, my, what I'm writing is actually based on my master's thesis, and it does deal with Bosnia. It's a creative, it deals with making an idea. It's a creative master's thesis, and I want to turn it into a book. Um, By the way, okay, she has a master's thesis on Bosnia. You want to turn into a book? This is the kind of thing that I'm going to give you the, the ghost editor's information. Because you never want to take a thesis or something that isn't book form to an agent yet. You want to work with a ghost editor, which, which we did actually on, on the Bosnia list. You want to work with a ghost editor and let them help you make it colloquial before you go to an agent. Okay. Great, we have time for a few more questions and, and I'll give you some emails. Yes. What's the book? The book is based on my TED talk about how books have the power of book. So, so it's a it's a nonfiction book about the power of books and writing. It's a, it's a, memoir. It's a memoir, so it's personal story. Right. Yeah, I mean, I personally think that memoirs are really hot in this country. So, I would say, um, I would. I don't know how hard it is to get it translated, but my first impulse would be to, sure, to try translate it. I mean, the other thing I would say to you, as we talked about here, many of my students have launched books by writing an essay. So if, for example, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to translate, and you already did a TED Talk, why don't you boil it down to a three-page article? There's many places like the New York Times Draft, or uh, Poets and Writers, um, Writer's Digest magazine, um, that love pieces about writing. Publish the piece and see if you get a good response and that would be a great way to approach editors if you have if you have a piece that um, you know that's sort of about your book project that's very popular that could be one way of doing it yeah. any other questions oh come on all my students and you're so shy 
censored? Is that what it was it censored? Was? There so might be something to write about. Also, yeah. why it was censored? Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, and then that's great. Renee and I were just talking about. Sorry, I'm just no, talking no, over no, you. it's okay. I'm such a jerk. No, it's um, okay. Renee and I were just talking. Maybe there's like a like a pen grant or something right. that would tra that would give you some money to translate it. I mean, the story sounds like if you had a book deal and then it was a censorship issue. I mean, that seems ripe for an organization that would get behind. Um, something like that. So yeah. I would look and into Penn. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Penn a couple months ago did actually send an email out asking Penn members if they knew of stories like no that. No kidding. Yeah, this is like six or seven Boom. months ago. Um, they wanted to sort of report their stories. If you email stories. me, I'll give you the info about Penn American Center. But also, by the way, Thank I love you, Kim's Kirby. idea mm -hmm. because censorship, drama, conflict, tension is a great subject to write about for, like, for example, a New York Times op-ed piece. Yeah. So that might be a great way to start um, to get attention, and then you could see if. Um, you could see if anybody else. Okay, last question for everyone, and then um, on the panel, and then we're going to um, end and hopefully sign books, and you can meet everyone. What are you working on now? What are you plugging? What should we be reading? Frank, are you teaching more at NYU? Um, uh, uh, you're you're open for more uh, yeah. ghost editing work. I'm yes. I mean, I'm teaching on ghost editing. Same old, same old. Um, I. You know, let me just say one thing about the empathy and editor thing. You know, what journalists know, like being a newspaper editor, I'm not a book editor, but like for newspapers, the best writers were people who identified and empathized with being an editor. Because an editor sees the newspaper and you say, crap, we've got to fill this thing up again this week. We just did it last week and we have to do it again. So the best writers for us were people who read the section like we read it, the city section, the home section, whatever, sort of immerse themselves in the mindset of an editor and then try to think of pieces that would appeal to the editor. We would always say, what kind of pieces do we like to run? Do we like? We like the kind that we run. So the empathy issue is really huge. I mean, also for all the readers of the books that these folks, you know, um, are agents for and publish. Uh, that's what I would look at. Sorry. Great. And um, Kim, aside from buying wedding cake for breakfast, A Gorge is a hot book of yours. Kara Whitley Richardson. Yeah. Anything else coming up that we should look for? I that's out now? Um, out now. Uh, I have three books coming out in September. Tell so. us. What's, um, what's your favorite that we should buy or look for? That I, well, I was just, I just came from a, like a two-hour marketing meeting about Bright Lights Paris, which is coming out. If so any Francophiles who are interested in all things Parisian, um, it's kind of a cool travel, what's hot uh, guide to Paris with essays and celebrities, and it's glittery and it's fabulous. Cool. So yeah. Kirby, aside from the Bosnia list, what should we be buying? That what what books have you agented that we should be looking for now? Um, I would say maybe check out The Invaders. Um, it is it is uh, it was actually the lead review for Oprah this last month uh, in the magazine, and uh, it was on Vanity Fair's like uh, Roundup. Who wrote July. it? Uh, the author's name is Karolina Vatslaviak, and she's the editor at The Believer, and um, it's a skewering of kind of race and privilege and class set in uh, 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 a very exclusive beach community in Connecticut. So. Cool. Renee, what, what should we look for of yours? I'm going to plug a short story collection. <laughs> called I Was a Revolutionary by a writer named Andrew Milan Millward, who's also the editor of the Mississippi Review. It's a collection of stories set in Kansas and along the Kansas-Missouri border, and is a look at the United States through the history of Kansas, which despite being flat and in the middle of the country, is actually a very interesting place if you look at it historically, politically, and socially. I mean, Governor Brownback, anyone? Um, anyway, so Kansas turns out to be a really fascinating place. So great collection out August 18th from Harper Collins. Woohoo! Danielle, what should we look for of yours? Um, I'll mention a suspense novel, uh, a little different than the nonfiction here, uh, called Somebody I Used to Know by David Bell, who's just a fantastic suspense writer, and it came out last month, July, and it's about kind of secrets in small town Ohio in the past coming back to maybe bite you in the butt. Um, and it's it's terrific. He's a great writer. He actually won an award in France. I don't know if that counts as multicultural, but he is he is American, but he won uh, a Best Novel of the Year award in France. So he's a great, great writer. Great. And Venus, aside from uh, Saul Bellow and also uh, Rob <laughs> Spillman's great African anthology, what else should we be looking for? Well, I just uh, finished working on a novel that I, I really loved. It's called Why We Came to the City. 
and for all of us who live in New York and uh, you know and uh, it, it's like reliving yes it's a new generation it's a millennial generation but it's um, it, it, it makes you go back to those very early tentative beginnings when you formed a relationship with the city and it's just a wonderful who's the author of that Christopher Jansma um, it's a second novel cool and it's just a wonderful wonderful book centered around these young people what I love about it is that though it's very specific and grounded grounded in today's culture and today's zeitgeist it also is universal it deals with people dying too early and um, and having to and, and, and the people around them having to grow up much too early and what that does to you you know it's just quite wonderful great and Naomi aside from um, our, we're doing our next event together on September 8th with Aspen Matus Girl in the Woods so I'm I'm dragging her on a book tour what else should we be um, paying attention to Kate Walters looking for a kiss yes and, and absolutely uh, pay attention to what's never said by Susan Shapiro <laughs> <laughs> I pay her to say that. All right, well, thank, let's thank these brilliant panelists. How many of you actually have the book? Because we, we sold out tonight. Okay, and we got some more in. There are some more copies that I just ran home and got. And this is the kind of thing that I do as a publisher. I'm also a courier. You know, I and this is the kind of thing I do as an author. Rush, come on, people want to buy these things. No, I mean, it, it, this is a nice problem. Anyway, have. listen, thank these brilliant people. And also, thank you. Also, remember... Independent bookstores are having a really rough time. The Strand Bookstore and St. Mark's Bookstore, these are the, the best bookstores in the world. They will not continue to exist and do these events unless we support them. If you want to do an event here, if you want to be up here plugging your book, buy books, buy magazines, great tchotchkes downstairs. So thank, this, thank everybody at the Strand, and hopefully you guys will buy books and come say hi and take cards and sign them. Thank you. Thank you.